Hi there. In this video, I want to talk about tabular uh, data learning, or better say, deep tabular data learning architectures. Uh, I will talk about two different papers that they are archived or published in uh, very close dates. The first one is uh, published in 9 December 2020, uh, which is called TabNet, Attentive Interpretable Tabular Learning. The second one is Tab Transformers, Tabular Data Modeling Using Contextual Embedding, 11 December 2020. Uh, you will see lots of TabNet versions, so it is important to find out when we say TabNet, what exactly uh, are we talking about and architecture we are uh, trying to implement. Uh, in terms of uh, what is tabular data processing, um, I can say briefly that we have a tabular data that including uh, continuous features and also the categorical features. Um, so those categorical features may be uh, ordered or the order is not important in them. But if we suppose that we have a continuous feature like age, and we have categorical feature like a gender or a relationship, stuff like that. And we wanna classify these data based on some features. And we have another column, for example, maybe this is a, a detection of disease or uh, stuff like that. So we wanna train a model that if we uh, feed these feature to that model, it will predict that what is the uh, output for uh, that person or for that role. Usually in the machine learning field, when we extract some handcrafted features, some of the handcrafted features can be categorical, some of them can be continuous. And finally, we want to do some, for example, classification or maybe a regression task, uh, even a time series, stuff like that. So um, briefly, the tabular in the tabnet architecture, they define an encoder and decoder, and uh, they are defining some sort of uh, sparsity loss that when we apply this data to the encoder, we get some representation. And when we want to uh, get the, uh, get back the data, some of the uh, missing information uh, can be imputed. So one of the features of this tabnet, uh, this one, the tabnet attentive interpretable uh, tabular learning is that it can be used for uh, imputation. Another thing is, for example, for supervised fine tuning, for example, we want to predict the income of people based on the some of some features like their occupation, education, and stuff like that. So we can use the previous encoder that we use, but we can have some layers as a classifiers uh, on the latent feature extracted by the encoder. So the main idea of the TAPNET uh, interpretable tabular learning is using that encoder decoder. And for defining the encoder decoder, uh, they are using some architecture like this. So they say it is a little complicated than the other paper. I decided to first explain this one. So we have some of the features coming here. We do batch normalization and we do some feature transformer, which is this one, uh, some a fully connected layer batch normalization, the glue and residual connection. And we have feature transformers and we split them. And when we wanna split them, some of the data go here, some of them go to the attentive transformers. So um, the reason they are doing that is because um, sometimes some of the features, we don't wanna use them because maybe those features are not significant or maybe they, they are, uh, they are like adding a redundancy. So we will have dimensionality curves. So as much as possible, if we can remove some of the features, we have better chance um, to get the higher accuracy or higher other metrics that we want. That's why they do attentive transformers and use a mask to mask some of the features, but still they have residual connections because uh, after using like feature transformers or attentive transformers, maybe we want to keep that residual. We want to we want to use that raw data or maybe untouched data to the next layers. So this is the overall 
uh, overview of how these tab networks. Of course, there are some more details like here that uh, they define a reconstruction loss uh, for self-supervised phase, uh, because as, as I said, it can be used for encoder decoder like an auto encoder model. And yeah, that's it. So they, they also show that they can get very good accuracy respecting even to, even to XG boost, uh, which is one of the best method for tabular data so far. So uh, they show that for some test uh, data set, they could get about 99%, while the XG boost could give about 70%. That is promising. Another paper that I want to talk about is this one. The tab transformer tabular data modeling using contextual embedding. The architecture is more simpler. So we define which one is categorical feature, which one is continuous feature. For categorical, we do a transformer. And for um, continuous feature, we do just a layer normalization and concat the features with the selected features by the transformers. And we do some MLP and multi-layer per perceptron uh, to do the task. So the complexity of this model is really less than the previous method. Uh, but they also, in the result, when they compare with some of the method like GBDT, so you, you'll see that they can achieve similar AUC and let's see others, like again, tab transformer, the tab net. In this table is the tab net that we saw in the previous paper. They are getting a little better accuracy than the XGBoost. So anyway, because they mentioned that the uh, TAPnet was not that good uh, comparing to their method, like here, 77% accuracy on TAPnet, uh, but they got a much better accuracy on the TAP transformers. So also they mentioned this is the AUC average and the standard deviation over 15 different data sets. So that's why I think uh, it's good to implement this one because uh, it compared it with the previous one and it could get a better accuracy. So let's give it a shot. So let's implement uh, the tabnet. Uh, we have most of the part implemented in the previous videos, like in the uh, video about attentional unit and uh, we know how to implement the PyTorch. So I will not explain a lot on the details. I will use a LucidBrain uh, GitHub repository and we just uh, try to uh, move the code here and we'll try to train on a simple data set to see the results and compare the XGBoost. So uh, let's do, first thing is the importing some of the library. We can define is the residual block. So we just get the function and what we wanna do is uh, we add that function to the input. So it would be a residual connection. Another thing that we can add is a pre-norm. So anytime that uh, we want to apply a new layer, we can have a layer normalization and we apply that near layer normalization and after that our function. So for activation function, we use GLU and also we define a fit forward, uh, which is combination of a linear a GLU uh, drop out and after that the linear layer. So we call it fit forward layer. Also, we get the attention class from the implementation of attention is all you need. You can have MLP classes. So the MLP classes is uh, getting an input and applying some uh, linear layers. And we need also a default function because we want to say that if there is nothing, we, if there is no activation defined, just use the default, which is really. So as I said, we need a default and uh, I can define it here default function that if nothing exists uh, as a val, so select the default and also exist function that if something is not none, so we say that this is exist. So the next thing that we need to define is the, is the transformer. So the transformer that we want to define is uh, created by embedding. So we get the uh, input and as embedding, it has, X number of tokens in dimension. And after that, we have a list of module, which is a residual. We have a pre-normalization uh, attention. We have 
we have created also this one in the attention is all you need for creating a transformer. So this is just a simple transformer. If you see the paper, you will see that there is a residual, the attention and a fit forward layer after that. So now let's define the main function, the tab transformers. And for creating tab transformers, the first thing that we need is defining uh, initialization function. And also we need the forward function. I think because the paper is separating the categorical variable and continuous variable, it's good to pass them separately. So we pass the uh, categorical variable from the transformer. That's why we need to define a transformer here. Yeah, and for defining a transformer, we need the number of tokens, the dimension, the depths that we have, the number of head, dimension of head, attention dropout, and uh, feed forward dropout. So all of these parameters that we have defined here. So that's why we need those parameters to pass the init function. So which means that uh, we can have the categories that we have, number of continuous variable, uh, the dimension of the data, the depth of the neural network that you want to have, uh, the transformers that you want to have, and other parameters that I talked about. So about the MLP hidden multipliers, the uh, number of special tokens that we need, and attention dropout, we can, we can define all of these variables. By these variables, we can say number of categories and also unique categories. The way that we are defining this is for each category, for example, we have one column and it is, it is based on two different categories, category one and two. So we can encode them as zero and one. And we have another column. It is also maybe a binary category, but we can start them from two and uh, we can go to three you know, sort of saying again, zero and one. In that case, we can define different type of categories. So when we apply the forward, it's good to uh, add a category offset to, to category that we have. The number of total number of tokens is based on number of the unique categories plus special tokens that we have. So by adding one at the start and zero at the end, when we do the comp sum, we are actually counting from one. So we can say, uh, categories offset start from one up to the number of the categories that we have. So when we say that for each category, we want to add the offset, we will be sure that they will not be similar or equal together. We will have a different category for each features. So this is for the categorical feature. Also for the uh, continuous feature, we, we can normalize them using the mean and the standard deviation. So um, we can register a buffer for them. So by registering buffer, we are uh, retrieving those offset. We are not training them, but we are retrieving those uh, values. For example, if we have uh, normalized the model using a specific standard deviation and average, so that can be uh, inversed. So another thing is we want to define a layer norm uh, based on the how many continuous variable that we have. If we can define the MLP, so we, have, we can have input size and we can create the MLP with all the dimension from the number of MLP hidden units. So what we wanna do with the transformer after we pass the categorical variable there is we wanna flatten them. So we will have a flat category. If we wanna normalize the continuous variable using the mean and standard deviation. So we, we should calculate the mean and standard deviation and unbind them. So we get the mean and standard deviation and we normalize data. That's why we register to the buffer. And for continuous variable, we apply the layer normalization and we need to concat flat category and normalize continuous categories. And after that, we need to apply the MLP. So we have all the parts that we need. Uh, the only tricky part is defining that uh, categories. So instead of having these offset, maybe other, other techniques can be used to uh, feed the categories to the transformers. So if we have prepared this, so now it's time we can use a Jupyter notebook, load some data and train it. So um, for implementing that, I was thinking that uh, maybe, of course, we implemented the this paper so we have the architecture of tab transformers, we have categorical and continuous and we did this. But in this paper, they mentioned that the accuracy and the 
and their method is better than the previous paper, which was this one. And interestingly, this paper said that on the poker hand induction data set, they're getting very high accuracy, about 99%. I was curious that, so if they are claiming they're a bit, uh, they are better than the previous one, so what is their accuracy on this data set? So that's why I prepared the train and test of the uh, poker. It is provided by the Kaggle and also from the UCI machine learning data set. You can download from both. First thing first is to import the pandas as PD. So let's see how is the train DF some, some of the data. So this is very simple. We have, we have all categorical features, I guess. There is no continuous features. So let's see if we don't have any continuous feature, how the, how the program performs. This is also another, another three that we need to care about. For test DF, we only have, let's see, let's see what, what do we have in the test. So for test DF head, so we don't have any prediction. So that's bad because we cannot use that. So in that case, I don't, I can use a test set because I don't have a label for evaluating the performance. So let's see, we only have this one instead of X train and X I can call them X and Y. What is the size of X? So it has enough. Mm -hmm. So if I say like 30% as the test and 70% of the train, that should be okay. I am splitting the data but also I want to keep this stratify. Yeah, so we will have all the data. So here, just, just to be sure how is the hand variable is, if it was hand, yeah. I can say value counts. See how the data is balanced. This is highly imbalanced data. You can see that this is also mentioned here. The problem is really imbalanced. Yeah, uh, severely suffer from imbalanced data. So uh, the next thing after splitting, uh, I have written the code to be sure that everything is right uh, to reduce the length of the video. So uh, we need to define the tab transformers and the categories here are how many unique category in each column or each feature do we have? And I set the number of continuous variable to zero. And for calculating this, a uh, simpler way is to uh, have, a, uh, have a max on the uh, columns. And because they start from zero, we can add one and put this array here. So I set the dimension of output to one. And the reason uh, is when we set it to one, the output layers that we get is 10 by one. And because number of classes is 10 is equal to number of categories that we are using, that's okay for this problem. But for other data sets, maybe you have five different categories and your number of classes is, for example, two. So in those cases, uh, I, I recommend that if you are using this code or Lucid Brain GitHub repository, just put another uh, layer after that MLP or change somehow that MLP inside the tabnet. That depends on the downstream task you want. But for this case, I can set it to one and I can apply argmax arg and uh, I can suppose that this is a classification. So I, I can use ReLU, I can use softmax. I used ReLU when I run the training and I got this accuracy. I will reach to that point, but let's wait. Um, I will explain more about how things are going here. So these values are recommended by the papers. We have attention dropout and the fit forward dropout. And for fitting the data for, we have the model and now we need to train a classifier. So like other systems in Torch, we need to define the optimization, the loss that we have. Uh, so maybe changing to this Adam can improve the performance. And after that, we have the main loop of the training. Uh, which is similar to any other training task that we do for the torch. Uh, and another part is this data set and we pass the input. This is training, uh, this is the uh, input and this is the output, one for training and one for test set. And each time we get the X and Y and get the data from the uh, data loader, pass it through the model 
and pass it through the loss and backboard. Finally, I apply the model on the test set, on the test data loader. And uh, I have a classification report that give, give me the accuracy, overall accuracy, the mock average accuracy, which is more important for us. And I think the paper, the first paper I showed are reporting 99%, which is this one, but they're not, they're not assuming many, many condition. I don't know they are reporting AUC or not, but uh, for example, in this case, AUC would not be that much. So uh, of course I just train it for uh, less than 30 epochs. Now I have it running for 50. The loss was reducing, but I don't have a good uh, system to run it now. I don't have GPU. Maybe I, I should put it in the collab and run it again, but seems it is working fine. Another thing that I wanna do is it's good to have the XGBoost model and compare this with the XGBoost. So you can see when I compare the XGBoost, of course, I didn't any fine tuning on the XGBoost, so it can be improved. Um, so in the paper, they mentioned that it can improve maybe to 77%, but you can see that 73, stuff like that is something that they report in the paper, which is right. And uh, so the performance of this tap net is interesting because we can apply some weights on some classes when we are applying training. We can do many strategy for imbalanced data and seems the accuracy and the performance is not bad. So that's the way in the, I think for the future of the tabular data processing and tabnet. Of course, be careful about this part when we define the dimension of output and see what is the output size of the representation you are getting and Based on that, define your downstream task. Yeah, um, I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you and have fun.